Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, the internet review show dedicated to discussing the differences between films and the novels that came before them. Today's subject somehow completely eluded me until recently. I must confess to a complete ignorance of its very existence until requests for it started cropping up in the comment section of every video I put online. Yes, it seems the nostalgia is strong with this one, but I'm afraid I can't allow the potential ruination of childhoods to affect my judgement. So, prepare yourself for an honest opinion of the adaptation of The Last Unicorn. The Last Unicorn was written by American author Peter S. Beagle and published in 1968. The adaptation came quite a few years later, in 1982. Impressively, Beagle wrote the book while he was still in his 20s. He followed it up with a bunch of other fantasy books, though from what I can see, none of them gained quite the same sort of following as The Last Unicorn. The film was a product of a company called Rankin Bass. It was co-directed and produced by Arthur Rankin Jr. and Jules Bass, the founders and owners of the company, and the screenplay was written by Beagle himself. So, if there was going to be any film production in the universe devoid of internal creative power struggles, it has to be this one. However, before we discuss said film, here's my thoughts on the book. This book really reminds me of Tolkien and his works, and while that's mostly a compliment, it's not entirely. Much like The Lord of the Rings, there's a really good story in this book, but to get to it, you have to wade through a lot of... Well, for want of a better word, I'd say heavy writing. There's a lot of very detailed descriptions of completely inconsequential stuff, a ton of tangents that add nothing to the plot aside from just being there, and a boatload of written songs that you're sure as fuck gonna skip over without a second glance. That said, there's a very good reason that Tolkien is held in such high regard. He and Beagle both have a flair of genius in everything they write and all the worlds they create. Other things in this book kind of reminded me of Sir Terry Pratchett, and that is and always will be definitely a compliment. A good example is the people in the story seem to be aware that they're in a fairy tale and that there's certain tropes that they're going to have to follow and they just sort of accept this as a tiresome inevitability. When someone sees an abandoned baby in the cold of winter being kept alive by wild animals, they don't think, oh no, it's gonna die, I'd better do something. They think, oh great, well, he's gonna grow up with a mysterious past and probably find a magic sword somewhere. We'd better go tell the evil duke who killed his brother for his title that he's only got about 18 years left to enjoy it. So too, being a hero and being able to do amazing things like dragon slaying and wrong writing is considered almost a genetic trait, something that's useful but not anything to be really proud of, and uh, the heroes themselves can often start to see saving the world as just an average Thursday. There's also things like uh, the people whose perspective the novel is written from are kind of aware that they are not the main characters of this tale and will ultimately not be responsible for saving the day. I came very close to not liking the unicorn character in this, but I suspect that might have been intentional on Beagle's part. She sometimes comes off as just a little too superior and borderline condescending to the mere mortal around her who are just so desperate to win her favour. I did try to let that go though because she's not aware that she's doing it. The nature of unicorns isn't the same as humans in this book, they just think and feel differently to us. I guess my mixed feelings towards her might be influenced by the fact that no one ever shuts up in this book about how insanely awesome unicorns are. Ah! they're just so magical, ah, all the way through the book. One of the big question marks that hung over this book for me is where and when the bloody hell is it set? My first assumption was that it was a purely fictional fantasy setting of the author's creation, but then everyone started making references to real world countries like France, Arabia and Greece and stuff like that, so I figured it had to be set on Earth, but presumably an alternative Earth on which magical and mythical creatures actually existed? Smendrick confirms that the language that everyone is speaking is English, so one has to assume that it must be taking place in England around the 15th century sort of time, judging by the mostly medieval technology level and the references to Robin Hood as a legendary figure. However, that's all speculation, and I have a feeling the author's answer would be it's wherever you want it to be, which would explain the mix of accents in the film. And finally, some admittedly very minor nitpicks, uh, as all the unicorns came back at the end and they weren't really gone in the first place, they were just imprisoned, the title of this book is a tad misleading. Speaking of misleading, if anyone tells you that the main character of this book is a unicorn, than they are being so. Yes, the story revolves around her, but out of the 14 chapters of this book, only the first four are told from her point of view, the rest being divided up between Smendrick, Molly and Leah, and she barely even features in some of them except by reference. Okay, now let's talk about that film. While this film is not exactly aimed at my science fiction obsessed self and my tricenarian age range, I can see why so many people hold it in such high regard. It's got an almost Studio Ghibli level ability to hit people right in the fields. That's not a random comparison by the way, 
lot of people who worked for Rankin Bass went on to work for Ghibli after it went under. The cast is reasonably star-studded, Mia Farrow as the Unicorn, Jeff Bridges as the Hero Prince, and Christopher Lee as the Evil King, to name just a few. According to Beagle, Lee came to the early production meetings for the movie armed with his own copy of the book in which he'd highlighted sections he wouldn't let them cut out. That guy was so fucking awesome. This is a very blue movie. Apparently certain colours, including black, were really hard to animate back in the day, so everything is just blue instead, especially if it's taking place at night. And I mean everything. The grass is blue, the trees are blue, the mountains are blue, the caves are blue, the castles are blue, the beaches are blue, even the fucking potatoes are blue! Why are the potatoes blue?! Slightly pedantic, I know, but the DVD box covers and posters for this movie really bother me. They seem to be doing their best to convince everyone that it's a much more childish and cartoony movie than it actually is. It seems an odd choice, that's all I'm saying. I don't think the colour scheme ever got anywhere near that garish in the actual film. This film is apparently a musical, but none of the characters sing until over an hour until the movie. It's so jarring when films do that. Either be a musical or don't, damn it! The other problem with this is Mia Farrow is not the best singer. The only thing I can really say for her is she's a lot better than Jeff Bridges. And finish, I suppose I never Other than that, the music in this is pretty good. The opening song was so popular, Kenny Loggins did a cover version of it in 1994. I'm poking fun of this film because that's what I do, but I will say in the highly unlikely event that I ever procreate, I'm sure this will be on my list of movies to show it. Anyway, let's talk adaptation. <laughs> Probably, not surprisingly, considering the identity of the screenwriter, this film follows the plot of The Last Unicorn very, very closely. So closely, in fact, that in order to list all the things that were also in the book, one must simply describe the entire plot of the film. So, no time to waste. A very, very old, but still young, because immortal, unicorn is living peacefully in a secluded forest and has done so for countless centuries. She overhears two hunters talking about her and is distressed to learn that she might be the last of her kind. She eventually decides that she's going to have to leave the familiar comfort of her forest and try to find them, or at least some evidence that they're not all gone. A rather unusual talking butterfly hints that the disappearance of her people might be connected to a creature called the Red Bull. Despite him seeming less than reliable as a source, she decides to seek out said Scarlet Bovine. Pretty much as soon as she starts travelling through human lands, she's mildly offended to discover that they can't tell the difference between her and a nice looking horse. She makes it quite a way, but eventually makes the mistake of sleeping by the roadside, and has the incredibly bad luck of being found by a travelling carnival that specialises in mythical creatures. It's led by a witch who calls herself Mummy Fortuna, who recognises her as a unicorn, so casts a sleeping spell on her and has her lackeys lock her up in an iron cage. One of said lackeys introduces himself as Smendrick and claims to be a magician. He explains to her that even though she can see that the cages around her are full of nothing but regular animals, Mummy Fortuna has placed a weak spell on them so the common folk see them as legendary terrors. However, in the cage right next to her is a genuine harpy, a creature of pure evil, part hag, part bird, and way now, what is, uh... What is going on with that? Um, okay, I'm sorry, no, I'm gonna need to come back to that later. Smendrick tells her that he's on her side and will set her free as soon as he can. He returns to her later that night and tries to magic the cage away, however, it turns out he's a pretty shite wizard and only succeeds in shrinking it. He gives up and just uses the keys he stole instead. One of the other carnies, a rather disagreeable gentleman named Rook, interrupts them and tries to stop the jailbreak. While he and Smendrick are fighting, the unicorn uses her magic horn to unlock the other cages and free the animals, including the heart. She's a bit of an ungrateful sort of monster, it seems, and tries to kill her, but finds the unicorn too powerful a victim, so settles for devouring her former captor instead. Smenjuk requests that, as a reward for saving her, he be allowed to come with the unicorn on her quest to find her people, even though he's next to useless. He tells her that the Red Bull is the companion of an evil king called Haggard who lives in a far-off castle. No one really knows if he is the bull's master or vice versa, or what manner of creature or demon the bull is, but he can lead her there. They travel together for a while before Smendrick is captured by some outlaws roaming the land and taken before their leader, Captain Cully, who seems friendly enough if a tad ineffective as a bandit leader. Cully's lady friend, Molly Grew, seems less friendly, so he tries to impress everyone by performing some real magic instead of the parlor tricks he usually settles for, letting Raw untangle 
untamed power flow through him. He summons a vision of Robin Hood and his merry men, which prompts everyone to run after them, begging him to let them join his much cooler outlaw gang. Cully and his lieutenant, Jack Jingley, decide this probably makes him a worthy hostage, so tie him to a tree so they can ransom him later. Smendrick attempts to free himself using magic, but only succeeds in enchanting the tree into falling in love with him, and mmm, mm mmm, mm mmm, 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 okay, nope, 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 I am not getting distracted, I will come back to that later too. The tree is overcome with anguish when she learns that she can't keep him and tries to kill him, but Smendrick's life and chastity is saved by the timely arrival of the unicorn. As they're leaving, they're accosted by Molly, who is at once both enraptured by the unicorn and mad at her for not having come to her when she was a young maiden like in all the stories. Nevertheless, she too pledges herself to helping her rescue her people from the Red Bull ignoring Smendrick's objections. Together, they work their way towards Haggard's crappy looking castle, but before they can reach it, they are set upon by the Red Bull in all its terrible glory. He chases down the terrified unicorn and seems intent on driving her to the castle as his prisoner. Desperate to save her, Smendrick once again summons his uncontrollable magic and turns her into a human girl in the hopes that this will confuse or distract her pursuer. His gambit pays off and the Red Bull fucks off back to the castle, but no one seems in a hurry to thank him. In fact, Molly and the Unicorn are both horrified by what he's done. By making her a human, he's made her mortal and doomed her to die, something she's not too keen on. Smendrick suggests that they try to finish their quest quickly, and then he will attempt to return her to her former glory when the bull has been dealt with. They approach Haggard's castle, observed by two guards watching from the highest tower. They meet at the gate and demand to know their purpose there, but Smendrick insists on talking to King Haggard directly. They are led to the darkest, dingiest throne room ever, where the guards reveal themselves to be King Haggard himself and his adopted son Lear. Apparently Haggard keeps his staff to a minimum to avoid extra expense and does a lot of his own work around the castle. In order to buy them time while they search for the Red Bull, Smendrick bluffs that he's there to apply for the position of court wizard, along with his servant Molly, and his niece, the Lady Amalthea, a name he chose at random for his former unicorn friend. Haggard informs him that he already has a royal court wizard named Mabrook and summons him. Mabrook happens to recognise Smendrick and tells Haggard that he's famous for being the most incompetent magician in the world. In a surprise move, though Haggard agrees this is probably the case, he still fires Mabrook and appoints Smedrick as his new royal sorcerer, his reasoning being that having a competent wizard in his service had failed to make him happy for years. So he might as well try employing an incompetent one for a bit. Mabrook is a tad miffed at this and unleashes a magic spell that the unicorn cancels out without much effort. In addition to Smendrick, Molly is brought on as the castle's cook, cleaner, chambermaid, and pretty much everything else. Lady Amalthea is invited to stay as well, but isn't put to work. Skipping forward in time a few months, Prince Lear has fallen hopelessly in love with Lady Amalthea and has taken to going out into the world to do great heroic feats like dragon slaying in a fruitless attempt to impress her. He has, however, successfully befriended Molly, who tries to give him some advice like try writing poetry or just being nice to her. Smendrick is quite frustrated after months of dancing around like an idiot for Haggard and utterly failing to discover where in the castle the king is hiding his red bull which they know must be there somewhere because they can often hear him thrashing about. A stray cat <sighs> Okay, well, it's not tits this time, but I'm still gonna have to come back to this later. A stray cat suddenly starts talking to Molly and tells her that they need to look for a skull that guards the entrance to the castle's secret rooms, and they'll need to get some wine to drink itself to get by him. Apparently what I've always suspected is true, if cats could talk, they'd be unhelpful dicks. Molly tries to talk about this to her former quadruped, but it seems her life as an immortal unicorn is finally starting to slip away from her, and she barely remembers any of it. Not long after, it seems it's gone altogether. She has no idea who she was before she was Lady Amalthea. Now that she's almost fully human, she starts to reciprocate Leia's feelings, falling in love with him as well. This is nice for them for a while, but eventually King Haggard, being a man it's impossible to get one over on, gets tired of playing games and confronts her about being a unicorn. She has no idea what he's talking about, but he assumes she's just playing dumb. He tells her that he has all her people imprisoned in the sea nearby, driven there by the Red Bull on his orders because seeing unicorns is the only Prozac he ever gets in life. Lady Amalthea is still genuinely nonplussed, but fortunately Smendrick overhears the conversation. He suggests they make one last attempt to defeat the Red Bull before she becomes too human to ever turn back. They find the skull that the cat mentioned and Smendrick manages to enchant it into talking. He isn't helpful, but is eventually bribed into revealing the way to the monster with the use of the wine that Smendrick apparently managed to create out of water and then convinced to drink itself. 
Okay, just one more of these, I promise. Anyway, the skull reveals to them that the way is through the clock in the main hall, then betrays them and raises the alarm. They flee through the ethereal clock and do indeed arrive in a secret corridor. Leah joins them and Smendrick makes it through just before Haggard destroys the clock, blocking their escape. Smendrick finally reveals Lady Amalthea's true equine nature to Leah, but he is neither surprised nor perturbed, reaffirming his love for her. For her part, it seems she's come full circle, and the idea of becoming a unicorn again and fighting the Red Bull horrifies her as much as becoming a human did. Not wanting to fuck her life up anymore, Smendrick suggests that she doesn't have to turn back if she doesn't want to, but oddly enough, it's Leah who seems resigned to her fate, telling her that they all have parts to play in this story and hers can't be avoided forever. The debate doesn't go on for long because around then, the Red Bull arrives to share his opinion on the matter. It seems he's finally figured out what the crack is with Lady Amalthea and tries to attack her. Leah's attempts to defend her are ineffectual, so ironically, the only option becomes a reversal of before, turning her back into a unicorn so she can fight him in her true form. Alas, she's still too terrified of him to do this and runs away, being driven all the way to the edge of the sea. Smendrick and Molly are powerless, so Leah sees no choice but to sacrifice himself by jumping in the way of the attacker. Enraged over his death, the unicorn finally turns to do battle. The Red Bull has no idea how to deal with someone actually fighting back, so buggers off into the sea. The unicorns come flooding back into existence out of the sea and destroy Haggard's castle with him inside it. The last unicorn stays only long enough to bring Leah back to life with her magic horn before leaving too. Leah is heartbroken that they cannot ultimately be together, but commits to being the best king he can be now that his evil father is gone. Smendrick and Molly leave together to travel the world. The unicorn bids them a final farewell and admits that she still has some human emotions left, the most prominent being regret, but is going to return to her forest regardless. In addition to all of that, I would also like to draw attention to some nice little details they stuck to from the book that I really appreciated. At least half of the dialogue in this film is word for word lifted out of the book, which was a really smart move in my opinion because powerful dialogue is probably one of Beagle's strongest writing attributes. My favourite part of the book was the conversation between Haggard and the Unicorn at the top of the tower, where he reveals that he knows her secret and the fate of her people. I'm very glad they stuck to it so closely in the film. In both versions of the story, the mysterious butterfly sings songs and makes reference as to things out of keeping with the time period of the rest of the book. It's very strange. I mean, I'm sure the trans space-time insect represents something, but damned if I know what it is. That it was Mummy Fortuna's insecurities about her pitiful magic that led her to overreach herself and try to keep a harpy cage despite knowing it was only a matter of time before she escaped and killed everyone. The unicorn doesn't know her own name, and this doesn't play a part in either version of the story once it's established. It's not the first or last fantasy story to put power in names, but I guess the author didn't want to dwell on on it. In both the book and the film, Haggard could very easily have been a foolish or amusing character. I mean, he lives in a wonky castle and is so cheap he only employs a standing army of four and acts as his own royal guard in rusty armour. He's basically Ebenezer Scrooge if he was a king, not a moneylender. However, the film successfully managed the same thing as the book, portraying what should have been funny as genuinely menacing. To me, King Haggard kind of represents what would happen if a sociopathic manic depressive were given ultimate power in the form of a magical familiar. Turns out that's pretty fucking terrifying. I really liked that they stuck to the fact that he died laughing, a creepy and intimidating end to a creepy and intimidating character. Whether this was because of loyalty to the book, Christopher Lee's awesomeness, or a combination of the two, it's still pretty damn impressive. A fine case of perfect casting for this character in my opinion. As for the unicorn herself, they held true to some nice touches, like her not being able to feel certain things that humans do, like regret. They also did a really good job of recreating the friendly enough but slightly aloof air she gave off. As I said in the book review, you could tell she wasn't doing it on purpose, but it really showed that she was keenly aware that she was a much more powerful and beautiful creature than anyone and everyone around her. They also remember to draw attention to stuff like the forest she lives in being forever in springtime, and how you can see it in her eyes even when she's not there. Physical appearance wise, it's a bit tricky to say whether she belongs in the changed or not changed category. The book makes it clear on multiple occasions that unicorns don't look entirely like horned horses. Their legs are thin and delicate like a deer's, their necks are much longer than horses, and their hair is soft 
short and flowy. They nailed that in the film, but the problem is that's just surface stuff in the book. This film faced the same issue as the poor fools who try to adapt Lovecraft novels, though on the other side of the coin. In the same way that Lovecraftian monsters are written to be unimaginable horrors, more the embodiment of despair and insanity than a physical appearance and therefore impossible to give form to with so crude a tool as an artist's pen or a computer's rendering, so too in this book a unicorn, when truly seen, is too beautiful, too indescribably perfect to ever be recreated on screen. The book got around this by describing the feelings of love and devotion she inspired in people and letting your imagination do the rest. The film, however, being a visual medium, had no choice but to present what was physically described as her appearance in the book. Until such a day that magic itself can be weaved into filmmaking, I think we have to give this movie some fucking slack and say that they did the best we could reasonably expect from them. The film's interpretation of the flaming Tauros suffers a bit for the same reason, and for the same reason I'm happy enough with their choices. The ball appears part physical, part ethereal, and part inferno. Oh, and in regards to the infamous line where Captain Cully offers Smendrick a taco, all I can say is, yeah, that's in the book too, and it's equally out of place and confusing there. Okay, this is quite hard for me to admit, but I've discovered through this film that the author, being the screenplay writer, isn't the wholly awesome thing adaptation-wise that I used to think it was, because, well... It turns out sometimes it's good to get a second opinion on things. There's some events from the book that any other writer would probably have quietly discarded, simplified, or explained a little better to avoid confusion. The prime example being, what the fuck was going on with the skull and the wine? I mean, can a skull only drink wine that's already drunk itself, or was that a trick and the skull couldn't tell because it doesn't have taste buds? The story is based on fairy tales, so some stuff isn't going to make complete sense, but that's almost obnoxiously confusing. Another is the complete lack of explanation included in the story in regards to that business with the unicorns in the sea prison. It can't just be a case of unicorns being amphibious, because the sea is massive, they could just have swum away to another beach and gone home. No, they're trapped in the little bit of sea near Haggard's castle as if it was a lake or a pit, and they're not exactly in the sea in a purely physical sense. <laughs> What the smeg is going on here? Now, I know what you might be thinking. The Dom, you British manhunk, how could you be so shallow and uncouth? These things aren't supposed to be taken literally, they're clearly allegories. And yes, I know, this book is very allegory heavy, and that can make it a bit hit and miss. I mean, if you get what it's an allegory for, it's great, it's really clever and it can really speak to you. If you don't, it can be confusing as hell. And here's the thing. This adaptation is a kid's movie. Adults can enjoy it, sure, but it's intended as a kid's movie. Kids don't tend to be all that on the ball when it comes to complex metaphors and social commentaries. I know it may seem incredible, me, advocating changing the original source material, but sticking to all the allegories verbatim kind of shows a certain lack of awareness to one's new audience, and I think a fresh writer would have picked up on that. This maybe it's okay to change it way of thinking is upsetting me, let's move on. In addition to him possibly being from the future, the butterfly, who incidentally she met on the road, not before leaving her forest, is a bit of an oddball adaptation-wise too. In the book he's, you know, a butterfly. The tiny gentleman in the film seems to have been given the anthropomorphic treatment, and even sports a tiny little hat and goggles. I mean, this is a kid's movie, it's not a change that confuses me, it's just there. In an odd deviation from the book, the unicorn says that she had forgotten that men could not see a unicorn for what they really are. The book makes it clear that this inability is a recent development. This statement is contradicted later in the film in one of the many occasions it used original book dialogue word for word, and she says there has never been a world in which she was not known. I suspect this was an attempt to make it clear to the young audience why humans thought that she was a horse and they just didn't think the implications through all the way. Smendrick's magician cloak is supposed to be black, but that's been made blue like everything else in this film. In the book, Captain Cully and Jack decide that Smendrick must be Leah after he did magic for some reason, and we're going to ransom him back to his father Haggard. In the film, they just seem to think that having a wizard equals profit. Everyone casually touches the unicorn too much in this film. Physical contact with her is a big fucking deal in the book. The annoying skull was just a skull in the book. He appears to come with a skeleton attached now, which makes him more interesting to watch, I guess, which is fair enough, but it invalidates his original backstory from the book, where he was an old henchman of Haggard's that the old bastard had decapitated for no other reason than he was trying out being evil to see 
see if that was what was missing from his life. For those of you who were upset by the fact that Prince Leo and Lady Amalthea didn't end up together at the end of the film, imagine how much worse it would have been if Leo didn't take it quite so well, because even though he knew it was inevitable, he couldn't quite fight the bitterness over how unfair it was. The last time you see Leo in the book, he's pretty pissed off. He's resigned to a life of putting everyone else first, be they the people he saves as a hero or his subjects, but insisting that he himself will never be happy again. The unicorn said goodbye to both Smendrick and Molly, not in person, but by magically appearing in their dreams in the book. Probably. I guess it's possible, but unlikely that they both just happened to dream about her at the same time. Leah is understandably upset that she didn't do the same for him, despite the others trying to explain to him that that's because he means more to her than them. There's a more recognisable change to Leah in the book, where he's established as friendly, but also lazy and kind of a downer before he meets Lady Amalthea and becomes a hero to impress her. I was momentarily perplexed by the scene from the book where Leah sings to Lady Amalthea, because in the film, a full musical accompaniment springs out of nowhere and then it becomes a duet. Eventually I realised the song was non-diegetic, it just took a while because there was meant to be a song at that point in the story. Prince Leah's death is toned down somewhat. Unsurprising as it's a kid's film, he just sort of falls over without a mark on him. The book describes how his body was crushed like a bug underneath the bull. We're talking half caved in head and leg twitching and everything. Okay, I guess it's time to deal with some shit. First of all, the Harpy and her three dangling tartars. Fuck me, what are the odds I'd get another three boob movie right after Total Recall? The thing about the Harpy is the original Greek myth described her as being part woman and part bird, but didn't definitively say what the ratio was or which bits were which. As a result, each interpretation of her has been a little different over the centuries. I suppose theoretically she could look mostly like a vulture, but with an unexpected amount of boobs, but here's the problem with that. That's not what she looked like in the book! She was described as having the face of an old hag woman and sharp looking shiny bronze coloured feathers that seemed almost metallic. They intentionally changed her so she has a messed up bird's face and added the three boobs. I don't understand why! Which leads me to the next brain hurter of the film, the big wooden jugs on the tree that Smendrick accidentally enchanted to be in love with him. That actually happened in the book and it was hilarious, but there's no mention of tree titties. Once again, this was a decision by the filmmakers to add titties where there were no titties before! Compared to the aggressive boobage, the cat with the patch eye and the peg leg seems almost inconsequential, but I should mention he was just, you know, a normal cat in the book. Well, aside from the being able to talk thing. The voice actor for Smendrick delivered quite a few of his lines, most noticeably the words he exchanged with Leah that prompted him to sacrifice himself, in a very different tone than how it was described in the book. But then again, I found his entire performance a bit monotone, so maybe that's more of a film complaint than an adaptation one. There's no hint of a romantic relationship between Molly and Smendrick in the book, and I suppose technically there might not be in the film either, but damn, that's some suggestive animated body language right there. So yeah, some changes, but so far the book loyalty section is dwarfing the rest of the episode. Let's see if it stays that way. <laughs> A lot of what I'm going to mention here is presented without judgement. As I said, there's quite a few things in the book that I feel could have been streamlined, and this film obliges with that. In the book, one of the townsfolk at the carnival questioned how the Midgard Serpent could be both wrapped around the earth and in a cage there, which prompted Rook to reel off some interesting bullshit about it being the medieval equivalent of interdimensional. Two missing exhibits from the Midnight Carnival were a dog made to look like Cerberus, the three-headed guardian of the underworld, and Mummy Fortuna herself pretending to be the demonic personification of old age. Another was Arachne, a normal spider that Mummy Fortuna had glamoured to look like a creature from an ancient Greek legend that could weave the most incredible silks in the universe. Arachne's disguise was even more convincing than most because the poor spider had come to believe in it herself and was most upset when Mummy Fortuna died breaking the illusion. Apparently the sound of a spider weeping is surprisingly saddening. I suspect the film didn't show her for the same reason I'm not showing any images of spiders. Nobody wants to see that! After teaming up, Smendrick and the Unicorn stopped by several towns where he earns them food and shelter for the night by performing his silly card tricks and juggling acts. He was slightly drunk in a rather rich and fat looking town when he was kidnapped by Jack Jingles and Cully's bandits. They'd come to town to pay tribute to the mayor for not having them all arrested, and one of them had stolen Smedrick's hat. He was trying to teach them not to mess with wizards by levitating it to the horse trough and dumping water on Jack, but as usual his magic went wrong and it went on his host the mayor instead. He might have been in even bigger trouble if the bandit hadn't decided to take him with them. There's more to Captain Cully in the book. I guess they covered the 
important bits about him being a wannabe Robin Hood, but there's a certain sad tragedy to his desperate need to be something he's not in the book that just didn't come across in the film. They left out the way that he almost pleaded to Smendrick, and through him the world in general, to play along with the lie that he'd wrapped himself up in. On a less depressing note, they also left out his shenanigans with the password to get back into the camp. Apparently Cully was prone to doing incredibly stupid things, like changing the password while everyone was gone, making entire long poems the password so the sentry had to keep giving people hints to remind them, and making it the call of the giraffe getting around the problem of the giraffe having no call by suggesting they do it three times, two long and one short. Haggard's four men-at-arms, only referenced in the film, play a small part in the story in the book. They were all at least over 70, and only in Haggard's service because they had nowhere else to go. They couldn't quite bring themselves to attack Smendrick on Haggard's orders, forcing him to do it himself, and apparently when the unicorn stampeded the castle to the ground, some side effect magic made them young again and gave them a second chance at life. In the book, the skull suggested that they smash him because he knew he would be unable to stop himself from yelling about her being a unicorn once they were done with the conversation. Also that Haggard did exactly that as punishment for telling them about the clock. Magicians turning unicorns into humans was foreshadowed in the book as Smendrick told the tale of his powerful wizard master Nico saving a male unicorn from hunters with that very trick. His unicorn companion was sick to her stomach at the very thought of it, telling him his master would have been better off letting him die as a unicorn. I mentioned that Leah was more established before his self-improvement phase in the book. One of the biggest contributors to this was the party randomly coming across him and his soon to be ex fiance having a picnic in the forest while they were travelling. Apparently it was a local tradition that, if a royal couple got engaged, the princess had to try to summon a unicorn to her before they wed. Leah acted bored and disinterested throughout the entire process, to the point where he comes off as being a total dick to his bride-to-be. At the time, the scene was more about the unicorn explaining why she didn't go to her when the young virgin called, and about her long past about when she did used to approach all such young princesses. You don't realise Leah is going to become important until much later. I would have to say that the only major omission that I think the film really suffered for is Hagsgate. Settle in, because this one takes a bit of explaining. When Haggard conquered his little kingdom, the first place that fell under his rule was the nearby village he renamed Hagsgate. Shortly later, he commissioned a witch to build him a castle using magic, then refused to pay her. In revenge, the witch put a curse on the castle, though that didn't seem to bother Haggard much. She then appealed to Hagsgate for help getting payment out of Haggard, but they decided they didn't want anything to do with it. Enraged by their apathy, she put a very odd curse on them too. They would be blessed with great fortune in their town, crops that virtually grow themselves, trade deals that make them rich, everything they could want, but she prophesied that one day someone from Hagsgate would destroy Haggard's castle, and Hagsgate would share in its doom. The end result was, for decades the whole town got shitloads of food and money, but everyone there was so painfully aware they would lose it all someday, they just couldn't enjoy it. Weirdly though, despite being made so miserable by it, they couldn't help but try to cling on to the curse that was making them rich. As a result, they all agreed that they would have to stop having children in the town so none of them could grow up to fulfil the prophecy. However, someone apparently just couldn't resist getting their freak on, and they found an abandoned baby in the town square at night being kept alive by stray cats that were warming him with their bodies. They tried to chase the cats off so he would die of exposure, but the next day Haggard announced that he had a son and heir to his throne, so everyone knew that he had come across the baby and, being the kind of man who likes to take things, had adopted it. Now that it was twenty or so years later, they were getting a tad nervous, so they tried to hire Smendrick as a poisoner assassin to take care of Leah so he could never fulfil his destiny. Smendrick happily took their money and simply absconded with it. When the unicorns were finally freed from the sea, they trampled Hagsgate to dust in the same way they destroyed the castle. Destitute, the town begged Leah for forgiveness, one of them even coming forward as his biological father. On Smendrick's advice, Leah decided to be merciful and agreed to help rebuild the town, though forbid the use of magic in construction this time. The Hagsgate part of the story showed that the author had a deep understanding of fairy tales, including that people in them were often disproportionately punished or were rewarded for minor acts, and showed how people can often end up desperately trying to perpetuate the very thing that's making them unhappy. That's why I consider it a shame it was left out. However, I will be the first to admit that saying that Leah was responsible for bringing the castle down because he inspired the unicorn to fight back against the bull, thus freeing the unicorns that destroyed it, is a hell of a stretch. A number of other characters contributed as much or more than him, especially if you count the unicorn herself. I regret just one other omission, though it's a lot smaller than all the Hagsgate stuff 
stuff. You see, in the book, two important things are revealed about Smendrick. The first is that he's not a shitty wizard through lack of magical ability, but because he's so brimming with magical talent, not even the greatest master could help him tame it. And they tried. His teacher Nico was considered the greatest wizard of his generation. When he found he couldn't help him, he decided the only thing to do was to ensure that Smendrick had enough time to find his own way to greatness, which leads me to the second point. It turns out Smendrick is immortal. Nico put a spell on him that froze him in time so he could grow no older until he'd mastered his powers. Now that may sound super win-win, but Nico warned him that this wasn't a favour, as immortality isn't all it's cracked up to be for a human. Smendrick soon found this to be true, as being a clumsy young man desperate to prove himself indefinitely is a pain in the ass. When the unicorn and Molly try to berate him for turning her mortal to save her from the bull, he turns it around on them by explaining how he'd love to be mortal again. He gets his wish as he can physically feel his immortality draining out of him when he finally gets a grip on his powers at the end and turns Lady Amalthea back into a unicorn, something even Nico himself wouldn't have been able to do. Now, I mentioned before that the last time you see Lear, he's bitter and broken, but that's not to say that the end of the book is a complete downer for him. Shortly after they part ways with him, Smendrick and Molly come across a beautiful princess who begs them for help. Her father had just been usurped and murdered by an evil duke, and her brothers were being held hostage in an attempt to force her to marry him, and a whole bunch of other fairy tale cliches. Smendrick gives her his horse and advises her to go and find Leah ASAP, seeing as he's become the go-to hero in these parts. It's sort of a final reminder that Leah may be heartbroken now, but as a handsome young prince in a world of fairy tales, whether he believes it or not, he's very likely to find love again someday. In an interview, Beagle mentioned that this scene was originally in the script and even animated, but eventually cut out of the final product, probably because it was unnecessary what with Leah's ending already not being so sad already. The Dom's- <laughs> The Dom's final thoughts. There were exactly five more tits in this kids movie than I would have predicted, and I have to confess, I didn't see them being deployed as murder weapons coming either. Sorry to keep harping on about that, I just had to throw in one last what the f Fuck. Animated films have a big advantage over live action adaptations because they can have their cake and eat it, they can make their character look just like they were described in the book, and still get an amazing actor to voice them. Taking into account the before discussed understandable inability to describe the indescribable, this film does not squander that advantage. The book came perilously close to boring me a few times, I don't like admitting that because I know a lot of people loved it, but there it is. The film didn't, but ultimately it also left less of an emotional impact on me. I guess what I'm trying to say is the film managed to fix a few of the book's flaws, accidentally created a few of its own, made a few interesting adaptation choices, and left out a few things I would have liked to have seen included, but at the end of the day, it held true to the book in all of the most important ways. It felt to me like a genuine tribute to the book, from everyone involved, not just the screenwriter, and was thankfully bereft of the usual attempts to usurp the vision of the author to suit the vision of the director. I suspect that a die-hard fan of this book would love this movie, and that's not always, but quite often, the highest praise I can give an adaptation. Hey beautiful watchers, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder that there's a variety of rewards you can earn by becoming a Patreon, including early access to all videos, getting to be a part of the survey about how many people saw the film and read the book, or playing Minecraft with me on my 24 hour server. Higher level contributors can also join the Dom Skype chat room, and best of all, choose future episodes of Lost in Adaptation. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the Dom, I can't do that, I'm trying to fund a musical loosely based on the events of Jurassic World and the giant animatronics are proving much more more expensive than expected. Fear not, if you would instead be willing to like, share, subscribe, or a combination of all three, that goes a long way towards helping my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. Have a most pleasant day, and I will see you soon.